You're listening to Rock Class Radio and this is your host Tanmay Shah. Today we are going to Bali, Indonesia and joining us is Tyrone Williams who is the host of Signal Podcast and the organizer of NFT Bali, the longest running NFT art event that I've ever heard 31 days at different locations and venues. He is the founder of the Collective Solution and he has brokered over eight figures in acquisitions in Bali. This episode you will hear amazing and fun facts about Bali and Indonesia that you had never heard or seen before. We talk about sales and event management and amazing quotes shared through the episodes. The best way to support this show is to share this with your friends and subscribe to the newsletter to receive the latest episode of Rock Class Radio in your inbox. So, Tyron, how are you doing today? First of all, thank you for bringing me on the show. I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking, and uh, I'm excited to get into this with you. Um, guide the way, and 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 we'll follow your how you like to do this. Sure. So, first we'll talk about Bali, Indonesia. Then we'll talk about you, and then we'll go to the signature round. So that's a common questions we ask everybody. So, what? is the most unique aspect of indonesia that you find that you find particularly interesting okay that's a big question that's a big question first 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 i guess we'll contextualize i'm half indonesian myself i've been coming here all my life mostly in jakarta and bandung which are more cities you know jakarta is kind of like the financial capital it's the, where the government is bandung is kind of more in the mountains um bali is the single hindu island out of a predominantly muslim and christian country um every other island there's 13000 islands in indonesia uh, is either muslim or 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 some kind of a christian or catholic right and so it's interesting because bali seems to act like the first step for most people most foreigners ever coming to indonesia they go to bali first and then they explore all the other islands and all the other islands are super diverse with all their own languages um you being an indian man i i understand that uh, you guys also have a lot of different dialects and languages all across the country right similar to that i think what's the most interesting thing or the reason why i'm here at the moment personally is that by being in bali i get to build a global network um there's a lot of opportunity there's a lot of really high level of remote workers travelers um great infrastructure great uh, cost of living and very creative very interesting entrepreneurs people think it's a holiday destination and it's great for that but there's a really strong market participation and market penetration when it comes to you know blockchain technologies even ai technologies um really cool real estate companies and yeah it's just a really interesting place to be at the moment i can't think of really one thing that makes it interesting but i think the the diversity of different cultures that are here and the absolutely astounding service industry um and the culture is it just makes a beautiful melting pot of of talent and opportunity and and mm. and everything that bali is known for you said the only hindu island so that took me back of the epic of ramayan and that's where i first heard the name of bali there's a character called bali and is that is there any correlation to that story and the name of the island I don't but now now I I I I don't actually have enough uh insight into that question but now I'm intrigued and I want to know so so I'll have to go and research that. That's very interesting. And everybody in the world knows about Bali but they don't know about Indonesia. So that's how popular Bali is. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people go Bali. Oh, that's pretty interesting. I think I'm going to go to Bali and then I'm going to try Indonesia. I'm like, you know Bali is Indonesia, right? Like and this, so, so that that comes out very often, yeah. So what how did you think Bali got so popular and became such a global destination? Look, you know, it's always been a great I think mainly first the culture is very interesting. The island itself is large and 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 very beautiful. Um the climate's fantastic and it it typically follows there's a theme right there's a trend where surfers will go first and then yoga people will go and then some businesses will be built to service them and then more people will go 
and then you know businesses, more businesses, entertainment, F and B, hospitality businesses all spring up in that region, and then more people can come, right? Uh, and Bali's definitely done that um, in a really good way. But more recently, with the rise of remote work, right, especially after the pandemic, you know, a lot of people realize that they can work from anywhere in the world. Why would they work in a city when they can work on a beautiful island? be surrounded by beautiful opportunity and, and, and people and, and interesting concepts everywhere. Um, live a better lifestyle for, for, for a lower cost, right? Like, and, and be around more interesting people. You're, it's, it's super, super important to your network. And so I think that's become a huge contributing factor, not to mention the real estate opportunity here in Bali is very, very lucrative at the moment. Um, and it's fantastic. I mean, of course, it, it comes with its own challenges, but even last year, you know, Bali hosted the G20, and a lot of a lot of the world leaders all came to Bali. Um, they closed down one part of the island just for government officials. Um, CZ from Binance was here. You know, all the big presidents and stuff. Like it was a very interesting time, and it's a very interesting place to be at the moment. And this year, India is hosting the G20. Fantastic. I'll have to come. I'll have to come. I'll, I'll come to some of the side events. And uh, which part of India? Where Where is it being hosted? It's all over different places in India. Even in Ladakh, there was a thing. So it's not at one location. It's spread out throughout the country. Different. Even in the Northeast, it's very interesting that they are spreading it out so that all the cities get the same attention. Yeah, it's good. It's good because then people get to see a better representation of a place, right? Like if you have, if I had my 31 day event in just one venue, it'd be really boring really quickly and they wouldn't really understand what Bali was about, right? That's why oh, we So it was at different food. events. Wow. Yeah, there's 31 different, uh, there was um, 31 different days with over 38 venues. Wow. Right? Venues and venue options and, you know, after party places and, it, it was a lot of fun. We'll talk more into detail about that before, I mean, uh, <laughs> when we start talking about you. So second thing I wanted to share was we had Anastasia, as you said, many people from the foreign come and settle here. So she, this is a 13 year old girl. You might have met her. She creates NFTs and art. Her parents are from Poland. She is in Indonesia now. And she had co-hosted with me one of the many of the spaces, Twitter spaces as one episode of the NFT uh, art for kids, so you can find it. But it is very interesting to know that people want to come there, Nas Daily, and so many vloggers and people. I think Bali and Jakarta are one of the most Instagram places. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you, how did you think it got so much popularity? Did government take some special actions or how was it promoted initially? That's a good question. I think that's, that's, you know, would be very interesting to study the history and how it all started. But of course, you know, if you go back long enough, there's a, the Dutch colonization um, and there's still long, deep relationships between here and, uh, and the Dutch. And so they've been coming back and forth for a long time. And then that's part of Europe. So more Europeans hear about it. And when you think about Australia, where it's positioned, um, Bali is really kind of the closest island destination you know, as Australians think Bali or Thailand, maybe the Philippines to a lesser degree, but those are kind of like the top three places Fiji? Australians will, will travel to. Fiji, what about Fiji? Beg your pardon, say that again. Fiji? Fiji too, absolutely, yeah. But when they want a more kind of um, Southeast Asian experience, they go that way towards mm -hmm. Bali a lot. Fiji is definitely a good choice too. I, I know Tony Robbins has, uh, has his resort there and does date with destiny there. So I'm definitely going to have to do that at some point. So Bali is so interesting. And why I ask this question is mostly, I mean, the promotion aspect of it from the government side of view, there's so many amazing beaches and Goa is there. There's so many other locations in the world. But if you observe and study what the Indonesians have done to promote Bali, that would be a great, it would make for a great study for how to attract tourists and then also for the property, real estate, everything follows that, right? Once you start getting in tourist business, all, all the different aspects of the economy start growing all together with that. 
Absolutely. It's their number one industry, tourism, right? And they, they, they want to make crypto the second biggest industry, but tourism is the first. Absolutely. You mentioned you are half Indonesian. Yeah, but from North Sumatra and Medan, uh, my tribe are the Batak people. Um, and the, the other half is Australian. You know what Batak means in Hindi? Tell me. I'd love to know. Duck. Duck. Yeah. We are the duck people. <laughs> you know, I like that because I, we, we like to talk about um, the duck analogy in our company. Uh, as a leader, you need to be like a duck. And people go, what do you mean? Well, you know, if, have you ever looked at a duck on a lake of water? It just glides, right? It's so smooth. It looks like it's not moving, but it's moving through the water super fast. But if you look underwater, it's... under the surface, the feet are like, <laughs> it's going crazy. There's so much chaos. But on the surface, calm, collected, graceful, sexy, even. And also, it never gets wet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's amazing. The duck is an amazing, um, what do you say, to study another bird and amazing stories on that. I want to take everybody to show where is Bali and Indonesia on the map. So I'm going to share my screen and take you all there. This is... Indonesia, such a big country. Wow. Thousands of island. I, I guess 17,000 was that came up and let's find Bali. It should be right here. This is Bali in such a big country. When you look at the country, the, 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 the island of Bali, it's a very interesting uh like the, the actual scale of it, when you look at it, it might look like a small island. And a lot of people think that the only thing in Bali is like Canggu, Uluwatu, and Ubud. But actually, you can fit uh, four or five major world cities on the island of Bali and still have space left over to build new cities. You can put oh, Tokyo, wow. New York, uh, and three, and I believe Berlin as well, some of the, 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 the European countries, all on the island and still have space left over. There's even people who are building, you know, micro villages talk about like 55 hectares 100 hectares with an entire thriving ecosystem of you know businesses and architecture sustainable architecture and very 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 interesting carbon neutral um next level architecture innovation you know like real world leaders are building very interesting things here where are They're you not... talking to us from right now i am in chamagi so just down here on the left, on the southwest coast, right near where all the gray is, if you zoom in right where you are, yeah, down to the right a little bit, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Okay, where are we? Uh, see, do you see that word, sese, down the bottom there? S-E-S-E-H, somewhere around there. In the south or in the north? Yeah, just b bottom right-hand corner of the, the screen, sese. I should be looking at the coastline, no, or in inland. Uh, inland, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Cool. So I'm around there. I'm about five minutes to the beach. It's beautiful. It's so you beautiful you hosted right your there. events all around Bali. Typically, we keep to the south of Bali within the Bukit, which is that thing at the bottom, um, and within the range where we were before, Sese, just before, mm. a little bit further on the right. So mm. down here. In between Sese and Denpasar, we go, and then we go up to Ubud a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great place. And then, you know, each region of Bali has a different, brings something very different to the table, mm -hmm. right? You go to Ubud, it's like this, one of the spiritual cap hubs of the world. You go to Changu, it's really high cash flow and business and parties and shopping and tourism, right? And then you go down to the east side in Sanur and Nusidua, it's really like hotels and resorts and holiday destinations for families or retirement families or, you know, young families. Mm. And then up the north, there's a lot of beautiful beaches, but it's a little harder to get to and it's far from the airport. But fun fact, you know, there's talks of, of an additional airport being built in the north, um, mm. especially considering, you know, there's a, there's a giant, uh, uh, I don't know if it's Disney or, or someone is creating like a theme park up in the north of Bali. So they're going to need their own airstrip. So they're taking it to a Singapore level. Yes and no. Singap in Singapore, you can build skyscrapers. In Bali, you're not allowed to build anything taller 
than the highest tree in your region. Oh. So it keeps it nice and natural. It keeps everything, you know, there's no skyscrapers. At most, there's, you know, three or four floors, maybe five. Um, but there's got to be a tree that's taller than your building. Mm -hmm. And you are so close to the equator. How does it feel like living on the equator? Beautiful. It's beautiful basically all year round. If it's raining, whatever. I'm in a nice villa. I can stay inside. I can get my work done. Um, right now as we speak, you know, just for the listeners to kind of get a peek. That's the uh, vibe outside. Uh, it's very nice. It's a, it's a nice lifestyle. And how did your parents meet? Where is your tribe and where is your other half from? Yeah, so my parents, my parents met, um, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a long story, but my mom actually uh, met my father who's 11 years older than her um, through friends in the modeling industry when she was 17. They kind of got together when my mom was 19. They actually had me when she was 19. My dad was 31. Um, they were together for a couple more years. And then she, my mom actually moved to Singapore um, with me and, and, and started her career at MTV. And, 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 you know, she was an international model and she did really well for herself, uh, especially, you know, her career has been quite impressive. I, I learned a lot from her. Um, she was a great MC and TV host. And so your mom is, things. your mom is from, Bali, uh, from Indonesia and your dad is. Correct. But technically, actually, if we really get down to it, my mom's half Australian, half Indonesian. So I'm only a quarter. Okay. My father's Australian. Um, but if we go down even deeper, you know, the Australian side of me has European um, roots in France, a um, little bit of New Zealand going on as well. Um, so so I'm really, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid of the world. My mom used to say the same thing. You know, we're, we're just children of the planet. Um, and I, I really, I feel very much at home whether it's Singapore or Australia or Indonesia. And I imagine I'll feel pretty at home basically wherever I go, right? Cause home is where the heart is. And, uh, it, obviously if you, if you really look into it, the hearts in our chest and we're always home. Right. So, and now everybody is coming to Bali. So the world is also coming to the Bali. Exactly. <laughs> and it, it's, you know, what's interesting is it only seems to attract if I generalize and I make a majority statement, it seems, or at least in my circles, maybe I'm just lucky, it seems to attract some very interesting people. Or, you know, the right kinds of people seem to come to Bali. There's either the, the entrepreneurs or the people looking for healing and they're ready to do their healing, um, which just kind of results in a beautiful, beautiful energy on the island. Yeah, for sure. And to answer, where's my partner from? She's a half Australian, half Dutch. Uh, she's here with me in Bali. My parents are you know, back in Australia doing all kinds of other things. What is the best advice you would give to somebody planning to come as a tourist to Bali? A lot of people go for a week. A week isn't enough. You need to come for at least a month. You know, you need to get yourself here. You need to, you know, a lot of people try to do all of it all at the same time within a week. They do two days here, two days there, two days here. And two days is not enough for any of those areas, let alone trying to do all of them in one week. You don't see anything besides one cafe and one lunch spot. You know, maybe one sunset, if you're lucky, if you're not lucky, maybe it's rainy that day and you really have to see these sunsets. They're absolutely stunning. So you got to give it a little bit of time, right? And you got to look a little bit deeper than just the first thing you see on YouTube. You got to explore, mm. you got to go on an adventure. It's, it's, be it's beautiful. And to come for a month, get integrated with some of the communities based on your interests. There's, you know, if you're into dance, there's salsa lessons, there's all kinds of things. If you like to party, there's a lot of that. If you like to you know, do holistic healing, or if you're really an entrepreneur and you want to meet investors, there's a group for that, right? There's telegram groups all over. They're very interesting people. Join in, have some fun and, and, make, and see what happens. Follow some of the locals to some crazy parties. What is your favorite festival in the country? Uh, I haven't been to enough. I, I couldn't give you an answer about that. Um, Whichever you have been, not, I mean, personally, which is your favorite? It's, honestly, it's, you know, Boiler Room was pretty good. That's not really a festival. It's more like a, a two or three day event focused very much on music and bringing music people together. Um, there's some great events that happen in the mountains with small intimate kind of groups of 50 to 100 people that all kind of, you know, introduce each other to each other. It's nice. It's this, there's all kinds of things. I, I'm not so much a, a festival person, you know, even with NFT Bali, 
where most crypto events, most events companies that are commercial focus on, you know, can we get thousands or 5,000 or 10,000 people in our event? Um, you know, can, how can we do, can we do something like that? And for me, my events are limited. Even for NFT Bali, we limit it to 200 people. Mm. Right? It's not an, it's not just an art event. You know, the art piece comes at the end in the final seven days, the first 20, you know, 24 days is there's a hackathon. There's an angels and founders week. There's a, um, you know, a, a welcome week on the first week where you're really just kind of getting, getting to know each other and going on adventures. And so it's, it's, it's for me, I, I got to kind of, I don't think anyone's doing it that way. And it kind of couples my, my, my whole point of you need to come for more than a week. So you got to come for a month when you come to my event. Um, and you got to be at a stage in your life where you can remote, you can work remotely. Um, and we, we tailor to that. So it makes sure that you can still get stuff done during the week. You know, it's not all day, every day for 31 days. It's some days are in the evening, some days are in the afternoon, but we're curating that in a way where you get an experience unlike what you would get as a tourist, uh, with Anywhere a lot of things that we offer that are, you know, not available to the average tourist. Yeah. I have pulled up the, the collective YouTube channel. Let us show some glimpse of the event to the audience. NFT Bali is a whole bunch of things. I would say being here, like, you know, together with a mind, you keep seeing the same people. Every day for 30 days. And the type of connection you make then is much, much deeper. I've managed to form deeper relationships with like my clients that I have coming around and people that I'd never known before the event. incredible to watch yeah it was i love the music where that was going around with it and we got good glimpse of how things look like in the bali and different islands and people and the whole vibe <laughs> pretty cool and 31 days what inspired you to start that and how was your story with nft bali I was sitting in Discord with our inner circle, the people who are, you know, our most, most trusted advisors and friends and, 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 and almost family, right? And uh, I was in Bali and I kept talking about bringing them here and they kept talking about me going there. And I was just like, you know what? I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to go anywhere else. Bali's perfect. I don't need to go anywhere else right now, at least not in the short term future. So let me just bring all of you here. All right, we'd spent a year and a half already curating some very, very interesting things, interesting people in, in, in blockchain and AI. And so just bring them all together as an opportunity to really meet each other and not just meet one on one, but like meet one on one many times with many different people you already had a little bit of a relationship with. Um, again, it, it, you know, it really kind of ties back to a week's not enough. And I really want to show you to be here 
And really, actually, I have an underlying intention to bring people to immigrate here. And 6% of our attendees have actually either already immigrated here now as a result or are in the process of immigrating here. And that number is going to grow each year. And we're going to get better at it. We're going to have a, a more seamless process to bring people here. Um, Very interesting. So it seems it's quite easy to immigrate. If somebody wants to, what is the process for them to settle down there? Dude, if you have uh, enough money to, to rent a place in a Western world, you have enough money to rent a place here that's nicer than what you've got in a Western world for the same prices, for sure. That's number one. Number two, uh, if you're making money online, it's very, very easy. You can just keep making money online. You can come here on a business visa and you can spend money here. Nobody's going to complain. Uh, if you want to start making money here, you got to open up a business and get a quitas and get appropriate visas. But for now, there's a really simple way to come. You could te theoretically come tomorrow uh, and stay for 60 days. Most, I mean, most passport holders, I'm not sure about what passport you hold or what that looks like, but in general, most people can just come for 60 days. They can leave for a while and then they can come back for another 60 days while they're testing it, right? Don't commit full time immediately. You don't need to commit to it years and years, but try it for you know a couple months at a time. And then while you're making money from here and, and integrating and, net, and make, making friends and doing cool shit, you can start looking at a more semi-permanent place, right? You can le you start leasing things for a month or a year at a time. And then you're and here. How quickly, how much time does it take? Somebody has decided, I love this place. I want to become a resident now. It happens pretty quickly, typically. <laughs> but we've had, we've had people move directly after NFT Bali or stay another month and then come back after going back to their country for two weeks to tie up loose ends. I've got, I'm currently in this place because, as I said in the beginning of the podcast, or maybe before we start recording, I actually live next door. Um, I got this place for six weeks for a bunch of my friends to come and live here, uh, and all of them were here for NFT Bali, and now they're coming back to stay here for six weeks and 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 test out the lifestyle. So once somebody has decided, from the government point of view, how much time it does it take? Because in US, it's a very very long time for somebody to immigrate, and other countries have other rules. You so know, believe... if you're getting a business and a kitas, you know, the, pro the whole process, depending on how quick you are with documents and payments and everything can, can be, you know, can be done pretty quickly depending on, on, on how efficient you are. Um, but if you've got everything ready, you know, it could take a month or two. Mm -hmm. And you do have to pay, how much do you have to pay to become a resident? Uh, it's not a resident. You just get a kitas, an investor kitas, which allows you to what have is kitas? Here. kitas is like just another word for some, you know, it's, it's their word. And okay. it, it's not quite permanent residency. It's not quite, um, you know, it's something or, in between. Yeah. It's, it's, it's their own thing. You can own a business, you can have employees, they can work for you here. They can make money here, but you can't physically work as a worker, uh, here. Um, ah. you know, me, me running events, for example, I cannot be the one who is doing all the, the lighting and everything. I can go there and I can speak. Um, and I can be a good host for my own event, but I, I you know, if I'm going to start doing all that, I need to have a business here. I need to have all the right visas and, 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 and that's important, but you know, it's not typically that difficult. Um, and, and for about, you know, let's call it five grand us, you can be set up pretty, 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 pretty ready to go. Amazing. You have a record of broking eight and above figures in acquisition. How did that happen? And that, that's brilliant. Congratulations for that, first of all. Thank you. By and large, mostly right place, right time with the right intention. It was very lucky. Uh, if we define luck here as, as, as you know, opportunity meeting preparation, I was prepared because I was already bringing people together in the collective solution who were high quality. Um, and I was always just putting people together based on why based on who I believe they need to meet for both of them to grow together, some kind of a win-win deal. And most of it actually came from one large deal, one large deal, which was me introducing Land Vault to Sam Huber from AdMix. Sam Huber from AdMix met Boomer and Satsuma from Land Vault. Uh, by the time it was like the ninth month in their business and they'd already scaled to a multi-million dollar business, it was just absolute craziness. Um, and then after a year, they got acquired to Sam Huber and we were involved in that, those introductions, making sure they got along and, you know, 
that was it. And we never asked for anything for those, for, for those, uh, our, our first two years was very much about proving that we were valuable in this market. Um, mm -hmm. you know, before this, I was running a, a business club for real estate agents for seven years, um, and focused a lot on, 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 on just my business, but now I'm very much focused on, you know, bringing people together through events with a really curated, uh, manner. So you're a catalyst and for the worldwide audience who's listening to this and don't know these companies, which industry they belong to? Which, say, say, say that last bit again? Which industries these two names you took belong to? So Landvault and uh, so Admix came from the gaming industry. Admix was the, one of the premier solutions for in-game advertising and monetization of games and gaming audiences. Uh, they did really, really well. Sam Huber is now based in Dubai. He has since moved there before, uh, after acquiring Landvault. And Landvault was a Web3 native uh, metaverse development company where most of their client work was creating, you know, sandbox and decentralized worlds based on people's needs and desires, right? Because all these people would buy sandbox land. This was back in, you know, the peak bull run uh, and, and the mania of digital land. And so much money was being spent on these digital parcels of land. Um, now there's these owners with empty plots of land who want to see those plots of land being built into something. And so they were the largest, the fastest growing, the highest quality uh, development house for developing metaverse lands. And they grew to like over 100 developers uh, in their team, uh, scaled very rapidly. It was a high cash flow business. Uh, and then they sold it. And, and, uh, both, you know, great, great, great people. All, all the people there involved are, are, were pretty wonderful. Wonderful. Many of our friends who are artists had participated and sent their artworks, especially Trezor's works to the exhibition. How was the art event and what response did you get and how was it? The art week was amazing. It was the first up, uh, first time we tried. So last year we organized everything by ourselves, but me, Bella and Tina from promotion events, who's been running events here in Bali for 25 years, uh, we kind of collaborated and she, you know, we, it was just three of us, right? We raised all the sponsor money, did all everything to do with ticketing and, and whatever, right? Graphics, everything from A to B and actually hosting the thing and even partying with the guests. Right. And so, um, this year, very dear friend of mine, Stanley, who now has since gone on to, to expand on the, the art week concept, pitched me. He was like, look, dude, you're bring, doing NFT Bali for 31 days. I think, you know, considering it's about NFTs and Web3 technology and, and the blockchain, we should definitely have an art week because a lot of the initial conversation around Web3 tech and NFTs specifically was for the impact on secondary markets with royalties and art, right? Which is very, very interesting. And so absolutely, I said, let's do an art week. It'll run in parallel to the main event on the, on the last week. Um, tell, tell us how we can help, you know, and, and, and we, we did open calls and it went really, really well. Complete uh, credit and kudos to the MuseHive team now. It, it didn't used to be MuseHive. They were all just members of the collective that I'd introduced and one of them knew each other already. And, um, you know, they, they ran a f spectacular event with a great, great turnout. It was a free, the art week, the exhibition itself that ran parallel to the main event was free. Every, the, 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 you know, the, the networking with, with the founders and everything continued for, for ticket holders, but the public, you know, all the local Indonesian artists, the expats, the families could go to the exhibition any day of that week and have a great time. And, and, and that was fantastic. There's a phone or something ringing. Yeah. Someone walked past and they were, okay. they, they were walking past with their phone. Okay. So that's very great to hear. I believe now you are an expert at hosting events and organizing events. What are some tips you would give to some, a viewer who is looking forward to organize events? I mean, first and foremost, why are you running events? Right? Are you running? Uh, the very essence of running events is you need to decide who you're bringing together. Because if you're just, you're just bringing people together, that's what it is, right? You're bringing people together to share an experience. And so for, for me, it's like, who are you bringing together and why should they meet each other? That's one of the biggest points that you need to make. So for me, specifically, in my kind of curated events, it's important to know who's coming beforehand to be able to understand who they need to meet during the event and making sure the right people are there. That's the first piece. The second piece is, you know, even if you're running a commercial event, you really got to hit people up with all five senses, 
right? Like if you want a fully immersive experience, the food's got to be delicious. The, if there's drinks, the drinks have got to be, you know, really, really nice. There's got to be great smells. Um, any materials that are used in the venue need to be, need to feel good. Uh, and, and the entertainment has got to be world-class, right? And so if, for me, I really focus heavily on quality and speed and getting things done really, really well at a high quality really quickly uh, at a moment's notice. So we, we get to run a lot of white label events here in Bali as well for other uh, people. I have hosted one of the biggest events of my college, so I know what goes into it. What are the biggest challenges you faced and how did you overcome that? The first time, the first time we tried to do this, it was just an idea. We didn't have a proof of concept. We didn't have media to showcase that it's possible. And the first thing most people said was, nobody's ever going to go to a 31 day event. Uh, that's too long. Um, we quickly found out that's not the case and, and we're already getting applications for next year. And you know, it's really just about choosing the right people, right? Cause there are so many people who would love, like, think about it, right? We don't just work 24 hours a day. We go for dinners, we go for lunches, we go, and if it's designed correctly and it's designed, designed thoughtfully, it's really a showcase of a, of a lifestyle destination experience. It's not a festival. It's not a conference. You know, there's workshops and stuff that happen throughout and there's parties that happen throughout, but it follows a format of what a week might look like, right? You've got your yoga day on a Sunday. You've got your co-working days on Mondays. You've got your workshops and presentations on Tuesdays and Wednesdays it's in, in, during the day. Then you go do whatever you're doing and Thursday's a dinner, right? So you might just work all Thursday. Then you might work all Friday and then, Friday and Saturday night, maybe you go dance, you go go for a night out with your friends, and so really we kind of emulate the lifestyle here in Bali and really showcase it while bringing the right people together. That's so it. planning all the events and detailing the time slots was the challenge. What no, about the challenge, sponsorship? The challenge was 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 get, was an, initially was getting sponsorship, and uh, but we're very very proud because you know most event companies. I didn't know this until after the last event. Um, but I found out from you know my industry mentors basically that most events companies are are actually not profitable and they don't even break even for the first three or four years, right? You got to sink a lot of money in it, into it to build a reputation. But we broke even immediately on the first year with like four hundred dollars to spare, and then this year we even managed to profit like four or five grand, which is not a lot. Right, but we managed to make a lot of other people money with our venue partners, our uh, you know, our real estate partners, our F and B partners, our entertainment people. So we put a lot of money in other people's hands, and we're building a lot of friendships and relationships that way, and that makes everybody else kind of want to build it with us. Uh, can you tap the table for me? Yeah. So sometimes in a talking, now you are hitting the table, so that that is oh, overlapping the. Yeah. Oh, that's my so, leg. That's my leg hitting the table. Yeah. I know what, I'll, I'll cut this part. Okay, so you, how did you approach sponsors? Where did you find and how did you approach and convince them to sponsor this 31 days event? So the first time we ran this, there was a lot of NFT companies that had promised events, uh, but didn't know how to run events, right? Because a lot of the roadmaps, people were just building the roadmap based on what the Bored Apes did. And they all promised, you know, token, merchandise in real life events. And I realized none of them, almost none of them knew how to run events and they bit off more they could chew. So they had a problem. They had a problem. They needed to be able to service events and they needed to be able to give their holders utility. You know, I don't really like the word utility. I call it value. So give their holders value. And so for me, it was very, very simple. It was like, let, let me go to all the people who have on the roadmap events and they're not running events. Let me just ask them for a really small amount of money, right? Like developer shops were asking for like crazy amounts of ETH to get things deployed. People were used to spending, you know, 10 ETH, which is 40 grand at the time, just on shit. So I just went to them and I was like, look, give me one ETH. You'll get our silver sponsorship. Give me three ETH. Give me five ETH. We're, we're our tiers for the first year. And we just made it all through sponsorships. There was no ticket sales. And we said, the people who own NFTs from any of our sponsors will get different benefits. If you own an NFT from a silver sponsor, you get one free drink at all our events. You know, the gold, you get two. The platinum, you get like three free drinks and a meal. And each day would have a different kind of benefit for you. And we invite you to come along, right? Which also made more people buy their NFTs just to come to the event. 
which then plugged them into communities. And it was, you know, people had a menu of NFTs that they could buy to get access to our event. This year, we did it through ticketing because we had more reputation. And this year, all we really had to do was send our video of the year one plus our new pitch deck. And it was really easy to get into conversation and people were excited to, to be a part of it. Wow. So you found out the value in both the parties and got sponsorship through that. Now, good, you are in the second year, third year is going to be even easier. I want to tell you one thing. I have asked so many people on this show, what are your thoughts on NFTs and crypto? Every 90% of them who are not related to cryptos have given a negative remark or something. They have a negative opinion on that. So how do you think will the sponsorship for the next events come from or what do you have to tell these people? Uh, sponsorships for the next events, there's not going to be an issue. There's enough crypto companies with money that really look for quality products like ours to be a part of. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is really the people with a negative opinion on crypto have had bad interactions with crypto or, ba or seen bad representations. Like any emerging market, like any emerging tool, a tool can be used powerfully or negatively. And typically how we pay attention to things with our, with our nerv human nervous system is we pay attention to negative things because it's more important to us to stay safe than it is to go and, and, and enjoy pleasure, right? You, you, fear is a more mo powerful motivator than, than, than uh, joy and enjoyment. That's why the news sells fear. Um, where am I going with that? The tr second truth to that is that 90%, 95% of people who are trying to use these new tools have no idea how to deliver value. A lot of them are first time founders. A lot of them, you know, are just doing it because someone else did it and made a lot of money and they don't know now what to do with it. Right. The, I, I, I really kind of encourage both people who are native to crypto technologies and people who are not yet native or don't really see what's going on. It's like the question is, what happens when you give someone, you know, $5 million when they've never even spent $5,000 on their business, right? They don't know what to do with $5 million and they're openly experimenting and making mistakes and fucking up. Right, which is part of the entrepreneurial journey, but now due to this technology has been magnified and amplified in such a weird way that people who, you know, might not have have succeeded building a real long term value creation business have succeeded in hype marketing and selling NFTs in a time when everybody didn't know what they were doing. So the market's maturing and real products are being built. Uh, but 90% of businesses don't need blockchain. You don't need to blockchain everything. I think a lot of blockchain people think that you need to put everything on the blockchain. Um, even a lot of Web2 companies or, or you know, non-crypto native companies are now come into crypto and they're like, hey, we want to do a blockchain version of XYZ. And the first question I ask them is, why blockchain? And most people can't answer. And there's no need for it to be on the blockchain. But when it comes to decentralized ownership or, or, or you and me, like we can start a company tomorrow, instead of going to a legal lawyer and creating contracts, we can create our own smart contract online, create a company we both own that can do things with digital assets and and even eventually to own real estate together and everything. And all of that is done and we cut out lawyer fees. We cut out intermediaries. It's all done by code. I don't even need to trust you anymore, right? I can do business with you because I think you're awesome. I don't necessarily trust you won't rob me, but I don't need to because the, the, the code is going to keep us both safe. So as long as that business keeps generating money, we're both going to get our equal share, right? And we can always do change it down the mm -hmm. road if we want to by creating a new contract. So trust is on the code. You don't need a middleman. Second, it's a contract. So everything that contract has been in real life, that all contract can be without any restrictions of government. You can create contract for anything from anywhere. Second, it's decentralized. So anywhere around the world can it happen. And it's always alive. Sort of, It's always there. Yeah, Nobody can shut seven. it down. I don't really like to use banks anymore because banks are shut on the weekend. They go down for maintenance and stuff. The code doesn't. The code is alive 24 seven. You know, it might be a Saturday night. Maybe I spend a little bit too much money. My, now I need a bit more money because uh, I'm out with my friends and I need to buy something, um, buy another round of drinks for my friends. I'm never going to be locked out because it's the weekend and I can't make a transfer with my bank. It's on 24 seven. And I can transact with you anywhere in the world. You know, remittances are, 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 are changed dramatically. It's, it has such a high impact on so many things.
but we're just getting it's it's all just getting started and not not everything needs to be on it what is your top nft of collector this episode is brought to you by tanmay shah that's me best way to support this show is by sharing this with your friends and dropping a comment and review on youtube Apple Podcast and Spotify. You can become my patron and a sponsor. That's not all. You can buy Rock Class merchandise and NFTs and much more. See all the links in description for details. Uh, so I don't. I actually don't have a favorite NFT. Uh, a lot of people buy NFTs for different reasons. Um, some to collect them just for the art. Some to invest into projects and speculate. Uh, for me, I bought them very specifically to get access to the membership communities because I wanted to meet the founders, right? Because naturally my business model is ra- built around founders and investors. The fastest way for me to meet them was to become active contributing members of their community, um, which, wow. which, which really brought their interest. Apologies about the dog. Uh, there's yeah. not much I can do about that right now. Um, we're, I guess we're going to listen to some barking at the same time. Hope it's not too loud. Is that your pet? This is the pet of this house. So my, my, my neighbor's house. I can tell it to... Who let the dog out? Yeah, for real, for real. <laughs> <laughs> it, it should stop momentarily, but that's okay. All right. So yes, you have bought NFTs for the benefit of communicating with the founders which are these projects or founders that you would name if you had to name one wow i mean there's there's the founder of eden ventures i I can't really name one there's there's zeneca from zen academy who's building a really beautiful education platform um which is crypto native with with you know short courses free free content a membership community um, there's Shan, who's uh, a tech incubator, NFT community from Project Jira. And then mm-hmm. I would probably think about Eden from Eden Ventures, uh, the, the largest, one of the largest Web3 VC funds out of the Philippines. Um, oh. with, the, with the world's largest gaming NFT and gaming, uh, gaming and Web3 gaming related portfolios. Very interesting. <laughs> Your mother was interested in music and modeling. Are you too following her footsteps? Um, I love music. I don't. My 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 girlfriend plays a lot of music as well. She's you know on the side just for fun, picking up being a DJ um, in her spare time, having a lot of fun. I like to hang around a lot of music people. Uh, of course, I like to to dress well. Um, there are some things that we're doing as a, as a fun side project down the road for that relate to fashion and, and, uh, giving our community the ability to accessorize and identify, identify with our brand, uh, in a really sexy way. Um, it's coming down the road, but it's def- it's not our main focus. Mm-hmm. Do you sp- how many languages do you speak? Just two, uh, English and Indonesian fluently at the same, but you know, I can I can speak in both and converse in both. Okay, like great. So let's do the one thing. Can you please close your eyes for us? Okay. Think of your favorite memory. Oh, there's a lot. And, and describe to us in Indonesian. Dua orang ke gedung di Bedugul. Kita bersama enam orang kita pesta makan. Uh, kayak retreat lah untuk 2-3 hari gitu bersama-sama kita pesta sampai pagi tapi makanannya holistik semua, organik semua jadi enak um, terus kan cuman ber- ada teman-teman semuanya jadi 60 orang kita bersama uh, musiknya keren uh, makanannya keren dan viewnya sih ada uh, ada sunrise sama sunset paling cantik wow, aku udah that before on a podcast that's cool yeah um, so as we are talking to people from each and every country of the world it's amazing to hear the sound of their language that's why so it was nice hearing that now could you please translate that for us in english basically said you know 50 to 60 of us close friends will go up into the mountains um here in bali 
and it's a real curated group of friends. We'll go up there, and the, the food is from the land. It's all organic. Um, there'll be great music, musicians and DJs playing. Um, on one of the nights, we'll stay up until the sunrise. On the other days, we'll kind of just relax and be really healthy and do yoga and do fun stuff. And it's with a good, great, great group of friends. Amazing. What is one wedding ritual that is very pecu- peculiar to Bali? What is one something ritual? Wedding, wedding ritual. Wedding ritual. Wow. You know, I I don't know if I if I'm the best person to answer that. I don't I don't tip, I haven't typically found myself at too many weddings. Um, still a young young man, and uh, yeah, I mean the, there's there's so many different kinds, right? There's the expat weddings. There's the local weddings, the local wedding traditions. Like if there's a wedding in my local village here in Bali, in my region, everybody in the village will take the day off for the wedding, right? No matter where they work, they will take the day off because their village has a special wedding for for, and it's the same for funerals. It's uh, it's very cool. The whole village takes an off. Yeah. Wow. So we, it's a public holiday in the village. <laughs> exactly. Not in the whole country, but just not even in the whole island, just in that village. Beautiful. That's something very interesting and special. Talking about that uh, that kind of phenomena, I think it's Indonesia that observed the Silence Day. Like one day, there's a whole Dude. silence in whole country. But in Bali, yeah, Nepi. So the day before is Ogo Ogo, where each region, each village will build lots of these statues. Schools will build them. Organizations will build them, and these statues will be carried around on the street in the night uh, to scare off the spirits. And the spirits then would be would be above the island the next day, right? So we turn off all our lights, we turn off all the sound, we use no electricity so that the spirits can't see us, and they disappear and they leave. And so it's a cleansing of the island once a year, and it's a beautiful experience. Typically, uh, you know, we'll we'll get a, get a few friends together, and the day before the silent day, we'll have a great time together, and then we'll observe the silent day together, and maybe we'll do some art, we'll have some fun and, and chill, but we'll be quiet and. Yeah. So I pulled up some photos. Yeah, exactly. Monsters sort of. Now this looks very Indian. Yeah, Hin- it's a, it's a Hindu culture here, right? So it's a mix of uh, Indian and because it also gives vibes of Thai and Chinese dragons in a way. Yeah. Like the, the 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 Chinese have the lion dancers. Um, they've got similar things here, but instead of a lion, it's a it's a it's a boar. Oh, um, and it's quite interesting. Yeah. So the boar is one of the avatars, avatars of Vishnu in Indian mythology. Mm-hmm. It lifts the earth out of uh, what do you say? So when the whole earth is submerged in water. The ho- the boar lifts it out and holds it on the top, and saves lives of people living on Earth. That's the story. I love that. That's super cool. So, what do the people do on the silent day, and how many years it has been since you have been observing that? So, I, I believe it's a pretty ancient tradition. I, I uh, couldn't really tell you, even though I've been here since I w- I've been coming here since I was four. I couldn't tell you the full history of it all. Um, so, it's ancient. It's not something. Definitely recently created. No, no, it's been happening for a long, long time. Um, it's probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, holidays that's island wide, um, and it's very strict. You cannot leave the your house on the silent day. You cannot be on the street. You can't be driving. So you can even get arrested if you're caught out of the villa or the the house. So it's like a COVID lockdown. <laughs> Sim- and- yeah, pretty much. With, and you cannot even talk. So do you even not talk at the in inside the villa, inside the house? I mean, you know, I guess that's up to you. As long as you're not disturbing your neighbors, you can you can do kind of whatever you like. Some people are more devout about it. And I imagine they spend a whole day in, in retreat, almost like a Vipassana retreat. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, not everybody and, and, and certainly not most most of the expats, I imagine. So this only, is, this only happens in Bali, not all over Indonesia. I couldn't verify for you exactly how much of Indonesia does it, but I believe it's a it's a predominantly Bali thing. That's interesting, right? When you have a country which is made up of so many islands, and because people 
and civilization might have grown up in those small pockets without much interaction with other islands everybody de- develops their own traditions and customs Absolutely. yeah 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 everybody builds their own cultures right like and it's the same can be said with with uh, any communities that you're part of online right you you really are affected by the people you're around and i think that's a large motivation of why i do what i do because i want to be surrounded by people who are better than me who are further ahead than me who are smarter than me who you know i can learn from or or i can i can compete in a in a healthy way you know some friendly competition mm-hmm. uh, and keep keep up with my peers or try to try to keep you know improving each other and inspiring each other to do better let's talk about traditional dress we are exploring dress cuisines culture music of all the parts of the world so i pulled up some dress native to okay which is your favorite dress i'll, I'll pull up that or which i'm pulling you tell us what occasion is this is this like a wedding dress or a spiritual so this traditional traditional balinese attire um from from my understanding there's Balinese attire, there's an Indonesian attire, um, and then there's attire based on region um, and also age. Um, mm. And even if you, you know, the difference between if you're married or you're not married, you'll wear different things. I wouldn't be able to tell you just by sight. Um, you know, I, I, there's definitely an opportunity for me to learn even more. I think it's fascinating and Balinese dancing is fascinating. Um, the Ketchuk dance festivals are fascinating. um very very beautiful with a lot this is the of... wedding dress yes yes there's a good photo of my father when my father remarried a balinese woman um when i was 6 or 7 years old and uh he wore very balinese outfits and uh, it was beautiful and very very cool yeah you you mentioned an event what was that let me pull that uh, also uh You are talking about Balinese dance ah, yes. and then you mentioned something. Ketchak. K E C A K I think. Ketchak. Like ketchup. No, without the T. Ketchak fire dance. Yeah, there we go. Fire dance. Oh wow. Yeah, and then they walk in the fire and uh, the story goes that there's like a, a they allow themselves to be in, to embody a spirit or allow a spirit to enter them um it's a possession for the for the duration of the ceremony is very very interesting you know it's so similar to the one which happens in the south india as well this is the photo from south very cool yeah you know the the whole this indonesian and up till korea there was this empire from the tamils i think they spread the culture to all these islands do you speak tamil no no <laughs> it's completely different i wish i actually want to hindi? learn tamil you it speak is hindi and what yes i speak hindi gujarati marathi and english my goodness four languages <laughs> i can only say anne anne saptin la Well, Jin, what language is that? It's Hind which is Tamil for brother have you eaten? Oh, yes Anna. Yeah. <laughs> And wow. then uh, you for you I call you I can say Baya. Yeah, Baya in Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you get to meet a lot and you get to you know a lot of words. I I believe that all happens because so many you meet so many people in the events. Absolutely. But also from my days as a salesperson I learned how to say I can't do it anymore. I can probably only do it in like four four languages, but there was a point at my peak maybe 8 years ago where I could say you're beautiful in like 32 languages. Um now I still remember, you know, Arabic, I still remember French, Portuguese, Spanish, uh a few others, but How do you say you're beautiful in Indonesian language? Kau cantik. Cantik is beautiful. Kau cantik is something you say to a person. Yeah, kamu is like you, cantik. Kamu cantik. Kamu cantik. All yeah. right. How do you appreciate an artwork or an object? Ha, uh, in Indonesian? Yeah. 
Oh man, I couldn't tell you. I think it's different by region and, and based on how uh, how people want to use their vocabulary, right? That's up to them. Um, how would you How would you say? I don't know. I think uh, can that be used even for artworks? Yeah, you no. Know, you just say "wah cantik banget." You know, it's like that's very beautiful. Okay. Banget being be, being very yeah. Okay. Wow, chante, bangat. All right. Yeah. So Indonesian is the name of the language, right? Or Bahasa. Bahasa is the name of the language. Bahasa right. Indonesian, yeah. Yeah, because people say Indian, but <laughs> Indian is not a language. It's either Hindi, which is widely spoken, and there are twenty-two other national languages. Yeah. <laughs> what is the local food that everybody must try? Uh, babi guling, which is they use every part of the pig. Um, oh. all on the same dish and it's absolutely stunning there's so many textures and flavors um, there's bakso which are kind of like the local meatballs that are come in soup um, of course sate and the sambal here is amazing uh, all the chilies and spices um, there's quite a few it depends what you're into how does a pork or a pig dish become popular in a Islamic dominant country I mean, here it's Hindu. Okay. Right. We we even had a holiday the other day where where I as I drove for my morning coffee, every hundred meters or so there was a full size pig, and there was a whole community of like ten twenty to twenty people. By the time we came back from our coffee, half an hour later, driving the same way, every one of those pigs was chopped up into tiny pieces, and then everybody in the village um, ate. You know, there'd be they all kind of been cooked together, and then they all ate together, and then, yeah, it was uh, just another way for everybody to come together. Coffee, Indonesia makes one of one of no the most expensive coffee, and it's made by poop, animal poop. Yes, kopi luwak. There's a there's an animal called the luwak. It eats the coffee beans and then poops them out, and then uh, it gets made into a beautiful uh, coffee that's quite delicious, actually. How does it taste? Can you describe the taste and compare it with a regular coffee? I don't know. I think that's one of those things you kind of just got to give it, give it a go. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more uh, pungent, should you say? <laughs> so this is the coffee, the undigested. <laughs> yes. Coffee beans are partially digested by this beautiful creature. Yes. Sea wet. Yes. It's not a cat. It's a civet. It looks more like a dog face, but yeah, yeah. It's this a strange-looking animal, but very cute. And then, uh, I guess it's made people. So, do you brew your own coffee? No, I, I, <laughs> I like to. I'm, I'm very much sort of restrained in that sense. I like to go to the cafe and get a nice, you know, long black or a, or a flat white, depending on the day. <laughs> and asking somebody in Indonesia if you. Brew your own coffee. It would mean like, do you pet the civet and like, do you do the whole process yourself? <laughs> it starts from that. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, it's very interesting how people find taste and develop taste, right? I'm sure it must be accidental or do you know how origin? How how did the origin start of this? Because like actually thinking, like thinking and eating. A poop of an animal and coffee would not be logical. Yeah, I mean, I imagine you know initially people might have just done it by accident, right? I don't know the full history or what what who wrote the history, um, but at some point someone decided this might this looks like coffee beans. Let me just try to roast them, <laughs> and it tasted a bit funny, a bit different, and then they realized it was poop. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possible. Wow. So you have a um, history of Dutch, right? Who, who were you? You are a colony of which country? Rephrase the question. Indonesia was a colony of which country? The Dutch, uh, sort of like Amsterdam, Amsterdam, okay. Netherlands. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, there's a lot of interesting things happening with the urban planning in Jakarta, for example, that is affected by um, when the Dutch built very Dutch architecture uh, here for a tropical country, which resulted in, you know, very, pretty rapidly rising sea levels in Jakarta and many parts of the city are going to be, uh, it's going to affect their, their 
it's going to affect living conditions. That's for sure. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's some big challenges there. So but you building a new, new capital as well. You're moving the capital. Wow. Correct. Where do you think it'll go? Um, it's up in, there's a great video for this. Um, let me pull it up and you can maybe share in the show notes. Yeah. So I'll drop this for you. Um, but it's in Nusantara. Nusantara. All right. You know, talking about Bali, this image of an architecture, there's this beautiful temple that comes to my mind. Let me share it with you. It's famous for these ancient uh, temples, right? Do you see Indeed. it? Yeah, yeah. And there's many temples here. There's more temples in Bali than there are homes. Oh. Wow. And even though I was reading a small article about the Balinese dance, it was first started out for the temples and then it got popularized and became sort of entertainment and indulged with different culture. Yeah. I mean, they're still performed predominantly at temples or in front of temples. Um, it's still a tradition, but they allow people to kind of partake in the tradition. I think Indonesian people, especially the Balinese, really like to share about their culture and feel a very happy when foreigners or travelers uh, show an interest or want to understand. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, it's a, it really kind of showcases the amount of love these, the, the Balinese have. Um, it's a really, really special place. And I think that's something that people notice no matter who they are, or where they come from, they notice that the service industry comes with a lot of love, right? They're not, you know, there's many parts of the world I've traveled to where the waitress smiles at you and you can tell she's smiling at you because she has to. Uh, whereas the, 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 the people here who, who are serving you, who, who, who are enjoying the process really are in love with what they do and you can feel it. Absolutely. And that's why... Bali is known as such a warm place, right? Hospitable and people want to come there and it credit has to go to the local people because if local people are, they don't want foreigners or they are against entry, it, it doesn't go anywhere, right? But when they are welcoming, like they are in Bali, so that's how it is growing. So I think one of this is a contributing aspect to growing a tourism destination. Absolutely. They, it's the foundation you built on. You said you're in sales. So what what kind of job you did do you did? So, so part of my life, uh, there, I was actually when I first moved to Australia, it, it took a little while, but I became homeless for the third time in my life. I was 20 years old and I didn't have any qualifications or or uh, a finished education. Um, I didn't have a network. I didn't have anybody giving me an opportunity. Nobody wanted to give me a job. The first thing I got to do was work 100% on commission selling perfume and then learning how to teach people sales uh, and then managing large teams. You know, I've, I've trained over 500 people in sales now over the course of um, 16 months. And so it was a very, very interesting experience. That's where my, the foundation of my you know, professional career really was built. And prior to that was a lot in customer service and hospitality, working in restaurants as a, as a teenager. Um, so I've always been kind of, and sales is service too, right? Sales, we're just communicating and helping people to solve problems. Um, and so that's kind of where I started. And then I got into, uh, a, a broker position as a, as a, kind of like a mortgage broker in Australia, um, helping foreign investors invest into real estate in, 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 in mostly New South Wales. So how many years you have lived in Australia and how many years in Indonesia? I spent a total year of about 12 years actually in Singapore and then the rest of it now. Um, so I'm 29 now, 17 other years, 17 of those years, let's call another 12 in Sydney and, and maybe a total of about four or five years in Indonesia across all the years. You mentioned three times homeless. And every time you got back up and put a, put yourself and you are as, as successful as we see you now. So what did you learn from these three experiences? It's not that bad. 
I learned it's not that bad. So a lot of people are afraid of like losing everything and having to start over again. I've started over so many times that I'm so willing to go to zero that I, I'm not afraid of failure. Um, I'm not af afraid of difficulty. Like a lot of people will give up before I do because they're just not as resilient. And I think I'm more resilient because of those experiences. And I also learned that actually when you're, ho when you're homeless, the biggest difficulty is not finding food and shelter. The biggest difficulty is finding someone who wants to talk to you. So what this was, was this your biggest challenge or what was the biggest challenge and how did you overcome it? Man, my life has been a series of challenges. I don't know. There's, there's too many to, to really pinpoint one, right? There's uh, you know, So it comes to the mind, like the, the most difficult. I don't know. I feel like there's your problems, any, you know, and I, I don't necessarily even believe in the word, word problem. Um, at most it's an issue. Um, and an issue just means who you're going to call. Right. And so, uh, I don't know, being homeless wasn't ever actually that bad. Um, starting my first businesses and losing them weren't that bad. You know, I think I, I, I tend towards being grateful that I'm alive. I think I'm very, uh, very lucky that I'm 29 years old. You know, my, I, I had a brother who was a set of one half of a pair of twins. He never made it to two years old. He, he drowned in a pool. And my sister uh, was nine when she passed away, never made it to 10. She had an asthma attack um, too far away from any hospital and died in the car on the way to the hospital. And so for me, even when I've had a failed business venture, even when I've lost all my money, even when I've had to call a friend and say, you know, I need to stay at your place for a while. I just lost my place. It's still a beautiful human experience of loss of challenge that I get to learn from and grow from. And when you kind of hit rock bottom, the only way you can go is up. Right. And if you're still alive and you're still healthy, you can still be grateful. So I don't know. I, I, I guess, you know, maybe the deeper question there is like, what's a lesson I learned from one of the challenges. I think it's, this too shall pass, you know, in the sense that if it's shit, it's going to pass. If you're having a great time, it's going to pass. Just go to sleep, wake up. It's another day, right? Like, and then each day you have to just focus on what you can control. Kind of think of the, the, the serenity prayer. Um, and I wish I, I knew it off by heart, but maybe I'll, I'll pull it up and read it to you all. Cause I think it's beautiful serenity prayer. Okay. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. One of my men my sales mentors actually had that tattooed on his on his forearm and I really took that one home. Wow. Many times people start pondering upon things that they cannot change or they're not in their control. So give us the wisdom to know which is what. And if something is to be changed, give us the courage and spirit to change it. Beautiful. Yeah, it's powerful. Many, a peop many times people give up on themselves or find the life meaningless when they are in too much trouble. So what kept you going or did you ever get into that mindset and how you, how did you get yourself out of it? You know, I think, I think most of life suffering is, is being unwilling to feel things. And I, th I made a decision a long time ago that I'm willing to feel whatever this world has to offer to me. Uh, I'm willing to feel pain. I'm not afraid of it. I'm willing to feel all kinds of things. That wasn't always the case. Uh, there has been cases in my life, especially in my earlier teenage years where I was suicidal and depressed. Um, and the truth is it was, it came from a belief that it would never get better. But then, you know, I kind of stuck around because of something my father said, my father also, you know, when he was much younger, when he went homeless at 16, uh, it's funny how cycles repeat patterns repeat, right? He went homeless at 16 and by the eight, time he was 17, he wanted to kill himself. And he told himself one thing. It was like, look, if my life is a book. Even if it's a shitty book, I'm just going to read it until it's the final, final page. Let me read it just to know what my story is. And that's kind of what got him going. And his life turned out beautiful. And there was many peaks and peaks and valleys. And so hearing that from him and then 
you know, as my time has gone forward, I've had too many times now where I felt so grateful and so overfilled with joy and love that I've looked back and thought, wow, I'm so lucky I didn't go through with that because it did get better. It did get so much better. And I think now having had enough times where shit has hit the fan and it's gotten better has just given me the faith that whatever I'm going through, if it doesn't, you know, it sounds cliche, but if it doesn't kill me, it just makes me stronger. What are you excited about in the future? More of my friends coming to Bali to live to, here in Bali with me. Uh, I think I'm excited by, you know, the, the possibilities that AI and tech are giving us. And I think it's going to allow us to evolve as humans and, and spend a little bit less time on computers and, and get back to nature. And, and a lot of the jobs that we could automate with AI will be automated. People will be able to think more creatively around their careers and what they want to give to the world. Um, you know, I think we, we, we don't spend enough time in nature. I don't think we spend enough time moving our bodies and we're, 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 we're really, we've kind of really built a visual world with screens and, and screens and more screens and, you know, and, and I think we got to get back into a little bit more of a physical world. And I think tech is going to enable that and, uh, and potentially even teach us things about, about things we've never learned. Right. And so I, I'm excited by the, by the tech revolution that we're in right now. I'm excited about the potential of my, all my friends moving here. Um, I'm excited to travel the world. I'm excited about a lot of things. You spoke about your own career and about investment opportunities. So what do you think are the good investment or business opportunities in Bali? There's a lot. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm definitely not a financial advisor, but it, it depends what you're into. It seems to be something for everybody. If you're, if you're into health and wellness, there's someone there. If you're into crypto and tech, there's someone there. If you're into real estate and design and, and, you know, music and fashion, it's thriving here. So it's really the best opportunity for you, best financial opportunity for you, for anybody is really the financial opportunity that interests you the most, the thing that lights you up, the thing that you can talk about for days and days and days and get excited about and stay up all night talking about it and you're obsessed with it. That's the thing you should go into because that's what you're going to most understand and be most excited and most alive, right? I'm, 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 I'm a firm believer there's a big difference between rich, being rich and being wealthy. I think being wealthy means far more than having money in the bank. It means having beautiful, um, lasting relationships, compounding relationships. It means having free time. It means having health and, 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 and wellness. Um, so the best investment is and always will be yourself. Uh, and then in the people around you that, that matter and that care about the same things as you. You spoke about so many beautiful things about Indonesia. If there's one thing you could change about Indonesia, what would that be? I don't know. Everything is superficial at that moment. Right now, it's just a magical place. It feels like heaven, heaven on earth. You know, maybe, 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 maybe make it a little bit easier for me to transact in crypto. Um, wow. Maybe, I don't know, some clarification, some simpler uh, immigration laws mm. that make a little bit more sense. Mm. Um, that's really about it. And when people come to Bali, what's the best activity that everybody must do? Shit, that's tough. Again, that's every that's like everything, everywhere, all at once. You know that movie? Um, it's really it's like if you it, who are, who's coming, right? If you're coming and you're you want to meet more crypto people, come to some of my events. If you're coming and you want to surf, I got some friends for you, right? Like it's it's depends. There are different strokes for different folks, but there's. The best parties I've been to in my life are happening here right now. Some of the coolest fashions happening here. The F and B is insanely high quality and high, very competitive. Um, resorts are amazing. You know, if you like animals, they're everywhere. It's great. I don't know. It's you know up to you. What is other less known fact about Bali? It's like I mean, it's an onion. A lot of people think it's just for holidays, right? But it's there's so much going on here. And every time you feel like you've seen it all, you haven't seen anything yet. If you could travel to anywhere in the world, where would you go? Um, I mean, this over the next two years, I'm going to go to London, Dubai, Costa Rica, and Portugal, uh, as well as Ber Berlin. And I have to make a trip back to Sydney to visit family. Um, so those are probably kind of the, the, the direction of where we're going to maybe Thailand as well as Philippines and Japan um, for, for a few conferences. 
what is the first impression that comes in your mind when i mention india the dark horse everybody keeps talking about china and the us superpowers i'm a firm believer that india could become a, the global superpower uh very very quickly out of nowhere and nobody's expecting it um there's amazing entrepreneurs they're super hard working super intelligent there's almost like a little bit of a chip on their shoulder cuz you know for whatever reason culturally you guys are really on a tear right now with extreme talent um bollywood's even bigger than hollywood most people don't know that um it's fascinating fascinating culture you know yo yogic traditions came from there i i have a deep respect and love for the indian people that i've met so far um you know it hasn't so far been the right time for me to come to india but i'm building more and more friendships and relationships with people there i have to go and see the zo house um from the zo zo zo, zo community um where is that meetings uh zo house yeah zo house it is in let's see it doesn't tell me immediately where the and you said is. dark horse dark horse yeah horse like a horse the like, animal yeah, horse when you're riding yeah. a horse so why dark horse that's the first time i'm hearing uh that's just like when you you know when you it's the the horse that you nobody expected to win but wins ah okay um, okay yeah i i i i maybe right, it's a horse it. racing term australians love their horse racing ah did you do australians even like riding kangaroos like is that a thing no no um but i did once tell someone that kangaroos walk around with uh walk around with boxing gloves and punch people <laughs> using iPhones and he believed me they so said we 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 i was 16 years old i was just joking with a friend of mine from america i was like yeah man they wear boxing gloves and if you have an iphone like the shape of the iphone because if you remember the iphone used to be like the curvy one um i was like yeah if you have an iphone they'll they'll hit it so you got to <laughs> hide your iphone and he fully believed me but there are a lot of videos of kangaroos punching also right <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so it's uh, it was it was close enough to be able to be believable <laughs> yeah i asked the riding kangaroos because i believe they ride ostrich the the birds so i believe it's doable for sure yeah <laughs> all right let's go to the signature round cool mention three people living or dead that you would like to have lunch with uh seneca that was a roman roman um emperor steve jobs and whoever my great 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 grandfather was from which side i don't know i don't know either of them i don't know you know if i go go back more than 3 generations i don't know who was in my family not really um i don't think most people do and so i'm really interested to know what 6 7 generations ago looked like probably do you think they'll meet up at one one juncture point like there could be one common grandparent <laughs> possible right yeah possible who knows i mean there's so many people that are related to genghis khan right so yeah <laughs> yeah we had genghis khan we had episode of mongolia and we talked about genghis khan on that so one in 16 people what question would you ask if you could ask any if you are if you could ask one question what question would you ask zeneka i would get his thoughts on what's happening with ai right now i think you should ask zeneka for that zen <laughs> all right what question would you ask steve jobs i would try to get him to distill design or the way he thinks about design to me what question would you ask your grandfather great great grandfather i would simply t- i would give him the whole day and i would say tell me about your life from start to finish and let him tell me the things that come up what it's like what's going on at that time how different it is you know how can i thank him for keeping you know this generation of of of, of uh this bloodline alive and and being my ancestor and probably it could be one of the buduk tribes in the middle of the jungle or probably it could be one of the dutchmen or englishmen <laughs> who knows yeah exactly right correct how to make money solve problems solve problems and uh money is simply a form of 
the people, a form of love and appreciation that people give to you for you to store, for you to use later and, and purchase more services and goods, right? So the more people who feel exp like they should express love and appreciation to you, the more wealthy you'll become and you don't get money by chasing money. Uh, it's much like wi a beautiful woman. If you chase it and you feel desperate for it, you're not going to get it. But if you're cool, calm and collected and you're solving problems for people and you've got a clear direction, money's going to follow to flow to you. Wow. You know, there's a concept of Maya that you just described right now. So if you sit at a place, whatever you want comes to you, like in a meditation position, or when you're running, then it runs further away. And when you are relaxed and calm and within yourself, it comes to you. So yeah, that's Maya. But very interesting about that, about to hear that thoughts, even for money, solving problems. Absolutely. What does art mean to you? Art is describing perhaps what cannot be described in simple conversation. What value thing art adds, adds for the world? Massive. I think a lot of things can be art. I think everything from, from the way we procreate through sex can be art. Or I think, you know, the, the way your house is designed and, and the way it affects your lifestyle is art. I think the way you present your business is art. I think drawing on canvases and, and, and doing cool things is art. How you dance is art. So I think it's a, it's a huge essential part of the human soul. It's how we learn about each other. It's how we learn about how we interact with each other. It's how we pass stories. The stories itself are, are, is a beautiful art form. Maybe one of the most ancient forms of folk, human creativity, right, is telling stories. So I think it's a, it's a massive part. And I think mastery in, in, in artistry respects mastery in business, respects mastery in athleticism. I think mastery of mastery itself is the most interesting thing, is how can we strive to keep doing better and keep innovating and keep pushing the limits of what's humanly possible. And that's inspiring no matter what you do. And so, again, that kind of comes back down to why I do what I do. I just want to be surrounded by inspiring people. Wow. What do you want to be remembered for? I'm not going to be remembered. Three, within three generations, nobody's ever going to remember me. So I, I, I don't really care. Um, I just want to enjoy and make the most of it. Beautiful. What is the best advice you have ever received? I mean, similar to that, someone just recently, I, I've received so much advice over my life, but maybe this is the most recent one that I thought was interesting. It relates to what I just said. Nobody's going to remember you in three generations. Do you remember the queen, the queen of England? Arguably, maybe one of the most significant lives in recent history over the last you know, few hundred years, the most impressive, powerful woman uh, with the craziest accomplishments. When was the last time you thought about her? <laughs> she just died recently. Have you thought about her in the last four months? Nobody gives a fuck. Excuse my French. I hope I can swear. Um, but no, nobody cares, right? So just nobody's going to remember what you do anyway. So just do what you really want to do and enjoy yourself. Too many people regret having lived life not on their terms, doing whatever someone else told them to do only to realize when it's too late they could have should have would have done something different don't wait till it's too late just do it now beautiful <laughs> and even some things that people tell you not to do absolutely you gotta you gotta often experience it for yourself because who who do they know what you like how do they know what you like right and is there there's like eight you know six seven billion people on the planet so many different types of people there's not just one way of enjoying life right and people will project onto you their beliefs and you got to build your own beliefs you, you got beliefs and experiences i can believe what i like about the u.s but until i go there to the u.s i'll never really know you know this is something i tell to all the opposition i get for doing podcast full time i mean you shouldn't do it and there's nothing in it and they give me so many reasons but i i was like when i look back doing this i wouldn't regret doing this or this is something i want to do i want to talk to people from different cultures and background so yeah there you go <laughs> what advice would you give your younger self trust the process don't don't need to be in such a rush 
what is the most priceless gift you have ever received my life and the people in my life what's on your bucket list next shit i don't know travel to japan korea fascinating cultures yeah about your events have do you, you fe- sorry have you been to japan or korea nope okay we'll i wish i yeah it's it, these are quite interesting i would love to go maybe we'll end up there at the same time who knows yeah probably do you ever wonder about making these events that you do bigger and bigger like what could be a bigger version of what you're already doing so nft bali next year will still only do 200 people for the first 28 days but on the last day we're going to invite an additional 800 people to come and join in the fun just for the last 3 days more of a you know entertainment conference model and how do you how how do you think it'll be 10 years from now that's a long time away we'll see we'll see 10 years who knows 10 years who knows that's it's a whole ass decade all the cells in my body will be different yep what is something that is your biggest disappointment i don't know like you know i have certainly felt disappointment at the time for different things but i don't know if there's anything i really look back and 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 i'm disappointed about or 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 i typically i typically you know everything's just taking me one step closer to where i'm meant to be um so you, you don't regret anything no my life's been too interesting you know like any change any little bit of it it would have changed potentially everything and so i wouldn't exchange what i've experienced for anything i really love that quote i'll put it as a caption i want to see the last page of the book i do want to see the last page of the book absolutely <laughs> i need to know how it ends <laughs> but i'm not in a rush to finish the book too quickly yeah it's not a short book it's a epic <laughs> ideally ideally yeah maybe there's four books what is your favorite movie i don't know but i will say i tend i typically think tv series are nicer than movies just cuz you can have deeper character development you can be more emotionally invested into it for a longer period of time i yeah i think so tv series and i really like you know peaky blinders um i really liked bloodhounds a korean tv show I liked Avatar. Yeah, a few. I still haven't watched Avatar. I got to watch. But is there a TV series also about Avatar? Avatar the Last Airbender, not the Avatar the Blue People. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what happens uh, about episodes and TV series to me? Because every episode ends with curiosity for the next one, right? You ha- I feel like I have to complete it and I just watch it. complete the whole series in 3 days like i need to reach the end like as you said about the book that's why i like movies better because once i start a episode or tv series i have to watch all the episodes till the end i i i i've definitely had some periods in my life where i do the same me and my girlfriend like to binge you know maybe we've been working a lot and we plan to like just do nothing for a few days and just destroy a tv series we have done that before and it's very satisfying um it's a beautiful way to kind of switch off but also because we're so interested in storytelling and so interested in cinematography it's it's like almost like a case study for why what makes you know great entertainment great and so it's it's a nice way for us to spend time what's your favorite book uh i got too many man like on the on the non-fiction side i really liked extreme ownership eastern body western mind um and anything by tony robbins is fantastic um as well as existential kink very very powerful book um I'll, sa- I'll send a list of those books very 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 good books um and then for fiction i don't know um, the first book i ever read was the harry potter chamber of secrets the second book um because my mom took me to the cinema and then i really wanted to know what happened next and she said well there's books you can read while you wait for the next movie i'm like okay and that was the first time i ever agreed to read a book uh when i was like 7 years old and then from there i became a really well read kid you know and uh so yeah harry potter series was probably one of the most impactful in a in a weird way so you like to read oh yeah there was a point uh, i used to read one to two books a week um i've done a lot of like book reviews and recommendations for members of my business clubs and we've had a lot of discussions around them because i feel like you know books are are basically your mentors if you don't have access to professional mentors or people around you 
you definitely have access to books and you can you can get access to books and they can be your mentors until you improve enough to be surrounded by interesting people yeah they are like the whole life and experience of the mentor compiled in one book mm-hmm. which you can read and grasp yeah it's powerful you didn't have to live 100 years in their life you just read 300 pages even even podcast in a way right capture it captures the whole thought of that person in that moment i like to call it as a bookmark in the life of the guest so <laughs> everything yeah. all thoughts in that i can, I can relate with that there's a there's a few episodes now we're recording of of guests that have come in the first 20 episodes now we're bringing them back um for you know because it's been a year or whatever and uh the lives have changed things have happened and it's really interesting to just kind of see where people are at with their with what they're doing yeah it's it's like a documentary also right Mm-hmm. all all the questions from diverse angles what book are you reading currently um actually finally enough the the, the health book by tony robbins uh, it's on my kindle i forget oh, shit unbreakable or unstoppable or something like this I just, something one of the health books he always has something else right there was unleash the power within there was whatever so my brother has also my younger brother has also written a book on same title unstoppable <laughs> send it to me i'll have to have a look absolutely what is so the book he has written is interviewed from different he was a sports person he has had different experiences in life and he has compiled stories of people in different backgrounds into one and put it in different chapters like great success and networking and different qualities and people related to that into the book that's super cool it's kind of like tim ferriss's book tools of the titans yeah 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 you can you can say that it's more more of the south asian perspective excellent that sounds like fun that sounds like fun let's do it great i'll send you the link and i'll also Please. put it in the description wonderful and all those people who get my brother's book get a nft from me so let me know if you're getting from that link oh wonderful excellent super cool you're going to have to send me information about your nft as well so i can have a look at it in the, after this call Absolutely it's just a photograph of me and my brother like just showing that you have you have the nft of buying this book it's fantastic <laughs> i like that yeah that brings me to the next question that i ask everybody what are your thoughts on nfts and crypto and web3 i think uh, there's we we're yet to see the way it could really be used we're yet to see like any tool i don't think we've really seen people achieve meaningful mastery on how to use it yet there's some people innovating and 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 doing some cool things but you know there's a lot of opportunity right now for people to get creative how to build these into their products i think it's it's just going to be a better way of doing a lot of things but not all things um and it's just about really understanding this is really just a most relevant for investors or for product type people to be looking at um not everybody really needs to know because eventually it's going to be phased out and you're not going to know you're using blockchain tech so there's you know if you're not interested and this doesn't interest you you don't need to go and learn it all you can come to someone like me who can help you uh make the right moves and to learn and use things that are already developed that actually improve your life that's a different story what is one thing you cannot live without peace and quiet man at the moment right i i got a lot of people trying to talk to me all the time and uh it's really just about saying no to things and i and i i and i need and i enjoy my peace and i like to just spend time you know in in a beautiful place with just the people i love and sometimes even just alone and and i think it's essential Makes what are you cu- what are you curious about everything all the time everywhere all at once <laughs> I'm an obsessive learner. Hmm. Have you created any courses? Yeah, I I did. I have. They're no longer online. Um because I if I ever do courses again, I I want to re-improve them based on what I know now. Um I had a public speaking course, I had a sales course. Um I had a small real estate course. I had a, a kind of a business coaching course. It was yeah it was good fun. I I I enjoy teaching. About sales, what are two top tips that you would give 
to any because everybody needs to know sales right we are negotiating and selling everything all the time even if you don't put a label on it but still we are doing it so what do you think what tips what what are the two top tips you could give for sales number one you got to really understand how people feel and how how you make people feel uh how you can influence that in a in a positive way um and you got to understand and how to read between the lines of what people want what people need by asking questions you know i think it's it's really really important to gather the information make the person feel heard um because most people want to feel heard and seen and understood if you can really understand them and empathize and really and you are in a position to solve their problem and you're good at finding people with that problem that you're good at solving that's really what sales is about and sales is just communication and communication should be you know how much are you listening versus how much are you speaking how often are you asking questions right and i i imagine you um bringing a bunch of people on your podcast asking questions you're learning all the time and that's really good you know really really powerful so people can do that in day-to-day careers and conversations just ask more questions to be interesting be interested one aspect about sales i've observed this throughout the time in nfts and in general there are some people who will sell whatever product it is even if it is shady they'll just go and say, say it very confidently but on the other side of the spectrum are some people who are not that self confident and don't have so much self esteem they undersell or they they think they're cheating others by selling what they have that becomes a barrier or a hesitation to talk to people they are not sure that if i mean it's very good it is going to help the people but still that it brings a resistance to even go and ask or take it a step ahead what would you th- say to that yeah yeah so what i say to them is that uh, think about when you pay money the only time you pay money is because you actually wanted the thing you wanted to eat eat so you paid money for food you wanted clothes so you paid money for clothes you wanted that holiday the only people who are going to pay you are going to be the people that want what you have and you should be valued and for solving their problem um you, if you have issues there around receiving money or speaking to people those are two different things right receiving money is one thing that they can be a shame or your narrative might be around money is dirty or evil or whatever or money you know some people believe money is the root of all evil actually the quote the original quote is the love of money above all else is the root of all evil not just money is the root of all evil right someone if someone's just decided the first half doesn't matter let's make the second half famous um yeah just just understand people can make their decisions you're not harassing anybody you're not extracting money from anybody if you are running in a you're a high integrity person doing business and you're really actually solving product problems through meaningful products and services you should be out there representing yourself because as beautiful as the iPhone is if Steve Jobs hadn't sold it to us none of us would be using it we'd still be using those fucking Motorola razors <laughs> right razors yeah so about money you said talking to somebody is different and getting receiving the money is different so let's go a bit deeper on that yeah sure i mean some people just in, uh, feel a little bit insecure not confident talking to people in general that's one thing um you know maybe you've got some some insecurities maybe you you know you 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 believe people are judging you it's really really different and it's everybody has a different path to becoming confident speaking and public speaking um so that needs to go on a case by case basis and then you know that's your relationship really kind of like with your with your throat and your lungs and your chest and and being able to speak your message um whereas financials and value and and that's actually closer related to your sexual energies and your creativity um you know and what affects part of the system affects the whole system of course um but those are two different issues right receiving and asking for money engaging and interacting with human beings in mm. general two different skill sets make so, no mistake those are skills not not specific knowledge knowledge mm. can be learned but skills must be practiced practice indeed about money how to become more confident in asking money or how practice. to get more money sort of practice <laughs> improve Pract- the skill practice, practice. practice and learn from someone who does it better than you be humble there's no shame in learning ask someone who's better who's figured it out don't take advice from people who have not figured it out 
There's too many poor people advising other poor people how to get rich. How many times should you follow up? Depends. Depends on your business. If you're sell- if it's a fast sell, it's a- it's different. Every every product and service has a different sales cycle. Some products will take you a year to sell, and a year to develop a relationship. Some things will be so I can sell you sell to you in thirty seconds if you already need it and you're in the right place. And it's also about the amount, right? I mean, real estate would take a while. A bit yeah, absolutely. To... Big purchases take big, bigger time. If you could travel, if you had a time travel machine, where would you go in the past or the future and to what place would you go? Honestly, nowhere. I don't want to fuck up the timeline. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anything in my life to have changed. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fuck up the timeline, yeah. We have watched so many movies that even small changes make such a big difference, right? You know, I, I read a quote the other day. Um, people are afraid to go back in time because they might make a small change and it'll change the entire present. But they don't think about the small action they make today could have a large impact on the future. Ah, wow. Profound. Can you repeat that once again? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you know, we, we, we all understand and accept the, 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 the logic that we can go back in time and change one little thing and it could affect the entire, you know, human existence right now as we're living it. Um, but we underestimate our potential to do something small today that could dramatically change the future for everybody. Beautiful. I even like the previous quote, my love of money over everything else is the cause of all evil, not money in itself. Wow. So many good quotes in this uh, episode. So thank you so much for uh, being our guest today. It was wonderful to My pleasure. gain your insights about Bali, about events, about sales and everything else. It has been a wholesome episode. Any parting words for the audience? What would you say? Slow down, take your time, enjoy yourself, hug the people you love and, 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 uh, just recognize you're blessed. You're blessed to be alive and listening to this podcast. You have the time and the 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 ability to to listen to people from around the world, learn from people around the world. We are in a very special time to be alive. Be grateful for it. Find other people who are grateful. Hold on to them and have a great time. Wow. Thank you so much. How was your experience today? Any feedback for the show? No, it's wonderful. I like the questions. I like the style. I like I like your energy. You've got a you've got a great um, you've got a great joyfulness to yourself, and I, I I can see you really enjoy what you're doing. Um, with any kind of like technical or you know skill related thing, I think you're on the right path. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily have any direct feedback on how to improve your skills. I think you've got your flavor. Everybody has theirs. Um, yeah, just keep keep at it, right? Keep keep consistent. If you're doing this full time and this is what you love, keep going. Invest into it and make some magic. Thank you so much. I uh, would love to come to Bali and meet you and give you a hug. Let's do it. Invite you to come to India. I'm so down. I'll I'll message you when I'm coming to India. <laughs>